So <clears throat> we're talking about, uh, we're actually kicking off this morning a series ca- called The Whole Family. And I am so, in my heart, excited about what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of months. Um, we're talking about a whole family. The every, there's so many components of family. There's so many different families. There's families that are blended. There's families that, uh, in a sense, just, just there's so many varieties, if you will, of family. And, you know, the cool thing about it is the Word of God uh, has an answer and has direction and clarity for all of it. And, and sometimes we think um, our family is strange or our family is like, but God, God is the author of family. It's his idea. And, uh, and he has plenty of stories and plenty of, um, uh, of people's names in the Bible that have some dysfunction. Right. And so if you were to read the Old Testament, you kind of would go, OK, you know, um, there was some crazy going on and uh, God worked through the crazy. And so we're going to start this uh, this morning, uh, this morning, uh, whole family. We're going to, the title of this morning's message is really family of faith, because this is where we have to start, okay? With our families, we have to start with reasoning with what God can do. So Hebrews chapter 11, I think, I believe it's verse 19, but this is where, uh, where Abraham reasoned that God could even raise his son from the dead. So when he brought Isaac, he reasoned. His reasoning started with God could just ra- God could raise him from the dead. So when our reasoning doesn't start with what God can do, we are isolated and hopeless. When our reasoning is based upon what we see in natural circumstances, uh, what we have seen it played out in history, family history. Um, our friends, uh, whatever it might be, whether, and you can throw this as far as family. And in family, there's a lot of things that affect family. There are sports that affect family. There's finances that affect family. There's in-laws that affect family. There's all kinds of things that affect family, right? There's health that affects family. There's just a hundred different things. There's schedules. There's where they're going to school here. There's, there, there's bullies. There's, there's all kinds of crazy things that, that happen in families and that families are having to deal with. And, and, and they face every day of how to make this schedule work. or how to. And, but when you and I understand and our reasoning starts with what the Lord can do, right, instead of just what we're left to, uh, man, I'll tell you what, there, there's hope for you, there's hope for me, and, um, and so we're going to, th- because we're starting as a family of faith, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit this morning, we did, um, regarding our f- father Abraham, and you're like, Father Abraham, I thought we like learned that in kids class, you know, maybe you never went to kids class, and maybe in kids class all you heard was, Father Abraham, we are one of them, right, you're like right arm, left arm, praise the Lord, right, like what does that mean? And so we're going to take just a, just a moment this morning and talk about a family of faith, and we have a father, and how we are actually grafted in to the same, same body. So we are, we are children of God. You ever heard of the Israelites as called the children of God? How many of you ever heard of the Israelites or is, the Jews being children of God? That's right. That's what they are. But that's what you are. You're a child of God if you are in Christ. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures, and then we're going to go to Genesis, and we're going to look at the start of God's relationship, which is what brought, through Abraham, which brought about uh, the Jewish people, which brought about the Messiah, or the Lamb of God, to take, that took away the sins of the world. Okay? So we're going to take a look at that, and we're going to see something that, that the Lord told Abraham right away, and this is the enemy of our, all of our faith, is that of fear. And he tells him, fear not, Abraham. It's the first thing he says before he gives him a covenant and a promise. He says, fear not. And so we're going to talk about fear this morning and the family of faith, but we're, first we're going to look at our father. So a few scriptures to kind of throw out there for us to, to see uh, how, how, this, how this works. Galatians chapter 3, uh, 26 through 29 says this, For you are all sons of God, or children of God. Um, why? Through faith in Christ Jesus. So if you have faith in Christ, you're a child of God. Next verse. For as many as you were baptized into Christ, you've now put on Christ. There is neither now, there's not Jew, there's not Greek, there's not us and them. There is neither slave, there's not free, there's neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. There's not, there's not sides, there's not, there's not classes, there's, there's in Christ, there's one. You're a child or a, of God. Next verse, last one. So if you are Christ... 
If you are Christ, you're a child of God. And if you're a child of God, this is where we see the children of God find their heritage or their start, their beginning is in Abraham. Then you are Abraham's seed. And because you're Abraham's seed, you are an heir or an inheritor of promise. So, so you have promises given to you in Christ and those promises that are given to you and me in Christ, and this is where our reasoning can start, right? Or we start our reasoning with what God can do. Uh, it's based upon the, the fact that we are in Christ and we, these promises are given to Abraham, and those promises are ours. The promises that were given to Abraham are mine. Somebody say that. The promises given to Abraham, given to Abraham. are mine. Because I am a child of God. So Abraham truly is your father. He is the father of faith. And so this is where the whole thing started as a father of faith. Before there was a law instituted or any of these kind of things, the father, he is our father of faith. And so it would be good for you and me to look at our father and, and how the Lord started a relationship with him and, and, and a fellowship with him. And a fellowship means going together, like going together with him and how he did it. And so, and so we're going to go there. I want to give you a few, um, a, a little background, starting in Genesis chapter 13, or 12 rather, Genesis chapter 12. This is where God finds Abram, not Abraham yet, Abram. He finds him. He says, hey, Abram, uh, come, uh, leave your father and go into a land I'm going to show you. So he calls in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram and Abraham answers the call. So that's, it's cool, Genesis 12. And then you jump to Genesis 13. This is a, it's a really cool story when you see how some of this is laid out and works. Well, when Abraham in Genesis 12 left his father, he also took Lot with him. Okay, and he took his wife Sarah at the time, and so now he leaves there and goes into a land that the Lord is directing him. And and as the as he goes his way, the blessing of the Lord. How many of you know blessing is in obedience? The blessing of the Lord is upon him and his all of his family. So much so that Lot and him have to separate because the grazing is just too much for the land, right? And so Abram says, rather than being contention between us, Lot. There's this land right here, and there's this land here. What, which one do you want? Like, I got the big half of peanut butter and jelly, and I got the crusty little dry half. What half, what half do you want? He's like, I'll take that big juicy half, and you can have the crust. Okay? That's, that's, that's Genesis chapter 13. Lot and his family separate, but God renews a promise in that moment. So when you get the crusty dealings of life, have you ever got the crusty dealings of life? You feel like you got the short end of the stick? In that moment, God renewed his promise to Abraham or Abram. Isn't that cool? Like in the moment where he's like, well, it looks like this. It looks like I just don't know how. The Lord's like, hey, I got you. And he renews his promise. And so then you jump to Genesis 14. We're going to get to Genesis 15 here in just a moment. But you jump to Genesis 14. And, and Lot, he is, he is down in the valley of Sodom. Right? He's down in the valley, and, uh, and the kings are warring over this piece of ground because it's so good. And, uh, and he gets captured, captured. And so he is captured, and the word comes to Abram. And he goes down, and he fights and gets a, a God plan, and he rescues Lot, defeats the enemy. And this is where the, the priest Melchizedek comes out and blesses Abram. Right with it says where, where Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. We see this in Hebrews, but here you see Jesus, or which is a type of the king of Salem, right? Melchizedek, king or prince of peace. It's like this foreshadowing of Jesus showing up, and he brings out bread and wine and cuts a covenant and blesses him. And Abraham gives him tithes of all. So all that he took, he gives him tithes. So like we see this way before a law, this, just, I, this understanding idea that everything that good and every victory and every help I have comes from the Lord. And here's Abram recognizing that, and the blessing is given to Abram. And so he's blessed and empowered from, from the Lord, from the priest of God, of the Most High. And, but then we get into verse 15, or chapter 15, and this is how it starts out. So he's been walking with God. How many of you have been walking with God for a little while, right? You know, maybe a little while. And maybe how many of you have seen everything that God's going to do in your life and everything you've seen in your heart? And, and, or maybe you're in the waiting. Anybody in the waiting in here a little bit? Maybe you're waiting on a piece, a portion. You're, we're waiting on God. And God has something to say about waiting. But, but Abraham or Abram had a lot 
going on that was being said to him. And how do we know this? We know this because in Genesis 15, verse 1, he, God starts out the conversation after a great victory. And Abram, in a sense, this is the, 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 the mind game that's going on with Abram. What's the point? Does it even matter? Like, this is what, and, and God comes to him and he says, after this thing, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision and said, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, afraid, Abram, for I am your shield and I am your great reward. This is how he starts out. He, the mind games of Abram, I won this great battle. I'm in this land. All this, all this, this blessing, all of this, this stuff that's like, what's the point? My heart's desire. You know what his heart's desire was? Anybody help me out? What was Abram's heart's desire? To have a son. But he'd been trying for a lot of years. He's in his 90s, and he hasn't had a kid yet. And what's the point? That I'm doing all of this, and I'm laying all, doing, and your blessings, but I, it's just empty. Have you ever just felt empty? Like, just, like he, he's just in a moment of chaos, a moment of noise, a moment. And the noise, it, it, this is a principle here that it, 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 I would say it this way. It's just you haven't seen what your heart hopes for, whether it's financially whether it's with your children, whether it's with your body, whether it's with whatever it might be. And here's this moment. The Lord says, do not be afraid. And then he comes to him and he comes with a promise and he comes with a covenant. Man, this is a great start. And this is why you and I don't have to fear. The Lord says, do not fear. Do not be afraid. So with that word or that direction from the Lord, it's also the empowerment, and he declares what it is. It's my promise or my word, but also my covenant, which I will cut with myself. And that covenant was a covenant in blood. And this is in Genesis 15, where the Lord came down. Abram, he opened up the animals, and the Lord passed between it because he could, he could find no one else to, to swear by that was greater than himself. Because he wanted to make sure there was not a weak link in his promise. Or a weak link in his covenant. If we would break covenant, then he would, in a sense, have a way out. Well, he said, I am not going to break covenant. I'm going to ha- keep my word, and I'm going to keep my word, and I'm going to break it with myself. Now, you, man, Abram, break, you, you do your part. You get the portion ready, and I'll cut. Co- you do your part. You got to do, you have something, you have a part to play. But so many times, we're not playing our part because fear has taken over. When fear takes over, Man, we we just don't play our part. So we're gonna get into we're gonna talk about fear this morning, uh, and we'll, we'll get there. Just want to give you a couple more verses. Um, Galatians chapter six nine through ten. It says this: Let us uh, not grow weary in well doing. And I love this. For, this is so fits for small groups. Even Galatians six nine. It says, "Don't grow weary in well doing, for in due time you'll reap uh, a harvest if we do not give up." Therefore, sometimes there's a therefore, therefore, something. And, and he, says, he says this, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially the family of faith. And Evan's just standing up here because I'm trying to lay this foundation as quick as I can here uh, this morning. So thank you for just smiling up here. Um, <laughs> there, there, but this therefore, he says, hey, do good. Why? Because people are growing tired. You ever been tired and somebody did some good to you and it helped you in your faith? I know for me, I've gotten a note in the mail. I've gotten, I don't know how this is going to work, and someone gets you dinner, and you're like, oh, wow. It was just a good. Somebody did some good, and it allowed me to stay in the race and to stay up. And the Lord's saying, hey, y'all, therefore, do good. As you have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Or you might have heard it said this way, or your translation might say it this way, the household of faith. But that word family, I wanted to hit on that, is that word means by blood. Did you know you and I, are, we're, we're blood brothers? We are of the same family, we're blood. Yeah. Like we're family, like true family, because we're by blood. Whose blood? The blood of Christ. So that, that's a powerful thing. This is, again, just I'm wanting to drive home tonight or to, the, to this morning that we are children of God. That's, that's powerful. And I'm a brother and sister in Christ with you. John chapter 1, 6 through 13. There, there came a man, this is John, 
uh, sent from God, his, well, I guess it says his name was John, he came as a witness to testify about the light, so that through him everyone might believe. So John's coming to testify about Jesus. He was himself not the light, but came to testify of the light. Number uh, Verse 9, the true light who gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Verse 11, he came to his own, his own didn't receive him. 12, but to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become. Whose child are you? So I just gave you this morning, just in that short amount of time, I just gave you six verses, seven verses that you're not just in this one passage in John, that you're a child of God because, because of Christ, if you, are, if you are, have believed in Christ. And the same promises that were to Abram or Abraham are yours. And God's not a respecter of person for those who are in Christ. So there are what we're talking about, and what when we talk about our family, this is our starting block right here. We have to reason and, and start with what God can do or what our Father can do. Yeah. I'm a child. When, when we're a child, and this is why the Lord says, go become back like a child. When, when you're a child, I have kids in my home that still want me to buy food. Like every time. <laughs> Though they're teenagers and they have jobs. And you know what? I love it. And you know what? When they, when, when, when they get married and have kids, they're going to call me up and they're going to say, hey, what's for dinner? Because then they're going to come over and they're not going to think they've got to bring 50 bucks to try to cover half the meal. Why? Because I'm their father. I'm their dad. God, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to provide. It's my pleasure. It's the Lord's pleasure to provide for his children. That is a good place to start. Maybe you didn't have that with your dad. Maybe you don't have that relationship. This is why we're starting this foundation of the series by looking at our father. Because every one of us have different, have different father moments. We have father flaws. We have father flourishing moments, right? Some of us didn't know our father. We don't know a father. But we have a father, we have an example, and we are, as a child, we see it in Abraham, but as a child of God, we have a father God, and he is faithful. Amen. So here we are. And, and the last bit is verse 13 of John 1, 6, uh, John 1, 13. Children born not of blood, nor of the desire of the will of man, but born of God. You have been born of God. This is where Nicodemus, not in this exact passage, he's like, how can you be born again? When you're born again, when you receive Christ, you are born again. How? Born of God. It's a mystery. But you're in him. Amen. Okay? First John 5, 4. Every person born of God. Every person. First John 5, 4. Every person born of God overcomes the world. Amen. So whatever you're facing, because you're a child of God, greater is he that's in you and with you and for you than anything you face in the world. This is the promise. So anyone born of God, here's what you have access to. You have access to Father God. You have access to Father God. The same way that the children of Israel were known by their God, that the enemies, the outside people, they knew that there's a God for those people. There's a God for you. Because everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everything you face in this world, everything you face in family, you can overcome. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. And that's what the Lord tells, tells Abram. He says, do not be afraid. I'm giving you a promise. I'm giving you my word, and I'm making a covenant. And this is where we go back, and we see this new covenant that Jesus cut with us, and he cut it in his blood again. He cut a covenant. This is a New Testament, a new agreement. My body broken for you or, or, or beaten for you, not broken, beaten for you. And, and my blood shed as payment for the payment or the remission of sins. Glory to God. So this is a good foundation this morning of, of just Christianity, really. It's like, wow, that's cool. Wow, I, I kind of got maybe a little more historicity of Father Abraham and what it means to be in Christ. So, um, so a family of faith. We're talking about this morning in a world full of fear. You can be a family of faith in a world full of fear. Let me say it this way. You could be a family of victory in a world full of defeat. And here's the question. If Satan is defeated, how come he can still run around? Because he's been defeated. 
All right. <laughs> Satan has been defeated. He should no longer be run. Cut him off. I right. think they just don't think it's very funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> like, I had that one in my notes. Like, that's funny. It just popped in my head. Like, that's going to be a good one. He came into the bathroom this morning and said it and laughed very hard. <laughs> Is that the first thing you said all morning? No. <laughs> Why don't you take over here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, but fear is not. So, yeah, that's awesome. No, this is, you know, I was telling her, she's like, no, I get it. And I was like, well, that was, that was, that was funnier than I thought. <laughs> Defeated. So we're going to defeat our enemies. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, and so this, <laughs> um, you know, we had talked kind of all week and um, just in regards to the family series coming up. And we all know, um, you know, the, what the world's portraying and what they're saying, they have no hope. And when I say world, I'm talking about people who aren't born again. They're not, they're not saved. All the, they have no hope. It's natural for them to be full of fear, right? Because, because they don't have Jesus. But opposite, the church, our families, our marriages should be full of faith and not fear. And this is how the enemy tries to come in always that we see is through fear. Yeah. And what does he begin to do? It's how he started in the garden right off with Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Well, what's he trying to do? He's trying to mar our father, God, who he is to you as a provider, as a protector. Yeah. And so we, t- we said some, a simple way to say that. You have no hope because you have no help. When are you hopeless? When you don't know that the medication is going to help? You're hopeless when you don't know that the job is going to make you when you have no help yeah. you're you have no hope and this is what is so important in, in, for us to understand and, and really grasp this morning is that as a child of God I have a father who is always there to help and so I never am in a place where I am hopeless the only time I'm hopeless is when my reasoning starts with what I don't have can't do right Instead of what God can do, right? So um, let's talk about what fear is not this morning before we get too far in. What is fear? Fear is not, first of all. Yep, so fear is not a feeling, and fear is not an emotion. And so this is huge for us in the body of Christ. Here's why. Because you'll hear the world talk about fear and what they talk about fear. And really, for them... It is, and I'm not saying feelings don't come with fear. They do. I'm not saying emotions don't come with fear. 100% they do. So I, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is the very root of fear is not an emotion, and it's not a feeling. And we'll see this here. First Timothy tells us this, but it, it's a spirit. It's a spirit of fear. So what the world tries to do, because, again, they have no hope, is they try to, you'll hear, just cope with fear or just manage your fear. Or it just gets passed down because, you know, in my family line, you'll just hear people say that it's just fear, fear, fear. Everything's just fear. So my grandmother operated in fear. I operate in fear. There's just fear everywhere. We're just trying to figure out how to cope and manage with it. But that's a scary place for the church. If we're just trying to cope with something and tagging it as a physical thing of just an emotion or... Or whatever. Because it definitely has it definitely has emotions yes. tagged to it. Yes. And those those emotions would be like the, the warning lights or like in your car that the, all of a sudden the gas light comes on. It's like it, well that light has nothing to do with the fuel other than the right. fact that it's telling you that there's not enough in the tank. Yeah. Well it's 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 a sign. So there's certain emotions that really that we're gonna talk about this morning, just two of them, that are indicators that fear might be in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Fear might be in, in this communication, yeah. whether it's between the spouse mm-hmm. or between our children or between our in-laws, yeah. right? Yeah. Or our mom and dad, yeah. right? Yeah. But fear is present. So, yeah. uh, so fear is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. And, and uh, we, we wrote this, and I just think this is so good. We, as the body of Christ, were never created to accept, cope, or manage fear. That's right. You weren't created to do that. That's right. That's right. 
You were created to resist and conquer fear. That's right. So as a child of God, like what he just talked about, I, I don't have to accept fear. I don't have to operate under fear. I don't have to let the fear and the emotions rule me. I'm meant to conquer fear and yep. to dominate fear. Yeah. Resist it. And so you fear, fear is, because it's not an emotion, it's not a feeling. What is it? It is a spirit. Now, what, when we say the word spirit, we're not trying to go, woo. <clears throat> if you were to look up the word spirit, you're going to see it's just pneuma, which means wind, breath, or spirit. And every spirit carries breath. It's a breath is really what it is. Let's use it that way. It's something that's breathing on you. What's breathing on you? What voice is breathing? What are you hearing? What are the words that you're hearing? Again, it's a spirit. And so 2 Timothy 1, 7. Go ahead. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. So there is a breath that God speaks as a father to his children. There's a whisper, a still small voice. The Bible says his children know his breath or his voice, right? Have you ever had your been talking to somebody and you smelt their voice, right? You you can't smell you smelt their breath, but their words, right? So their breath. So God's children they know His breath, they know His voice, and so this is the voice that God speaks is not one of fear, but the voice or is one of power, love, and a sound mind. There is power available to you. So let me say it this way: the the voice or the spirit that God brings is a spirit or a breath of help. Or you could hear like a breath of fresh air, like a power of love. Uh, uh, You know, love's powerful. Even how God deals with you, what he speaks about you. Landon was talking this morning about, uh, you know, there is now therefore no condemnation in Christ. Well, where does that even find its roots? Well, you you could, in love. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, that, that we always think of a love, that how I'm supposed to treat my son or how I'm supposed to treat one another. But that's how God treats us. It's, you know, he's patient, he's kind, he doesn't count. Wow, all these things. Wow. Okay. So this is great um, questions to ask ourselves in our marriage, in our families, and in life, is what's motivating me? The decisions that I'm making, how we're operating as a family, how I'm operating as a spouse. What's motivating my actions? What's motivating my decisions? Is it from a place of faith or full trust in the Lord? Or is it from a place of fear? And you've talked about this many times, but fear likes to try to drive us and cause us and force us and pressure us to make a decision or to do something. And and that's from a place of fear. Because what do we see? That, That God leads us. Everywhere that describes the Lord, he talks about leading you. He never talks about driving you. How many of you have been there before? When you're in a, a, a very fearful environment or a fearful situation, there's panic. Your heart starts to race. There's natural things that, symptoms that show up in your body. There's natural things that go on. Well, why is that? It's a spiritual thing. And it's trying to drive you and dominate you. And in those moments, if we can learn to stop and say, Lord, this isn't of you. Did you know you can take a, there's nothing that's so pressured that you can't take a moment to tap, to tap the inside and to say, Lord, this isn't right. There's fear present and where fear is present, I am not going to make a right decision. So this is why we tell, tell people even uh, when I'm led by fear, fear is present, fear can be present, but you know, but it can be present, but you can listen to the voice of the Lord. And you also can't do this. One of the things I want to say in regard to fear, I hear people say things like this. Well, I just want to do certain things to mitigate fear. So I'm going to do a natural thing. I want to shore up my boundaries to eliminate, like, because spirits walk through walls. So there is not something you can do naturally that's going to mitigate fear. That fear will still be there. Just as Job said, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. Did you know he was doing some natural things, trying to appease after his sons and his daughters were having parties 
right? He, would, he was like, okay, I got to make sure, because I probably sinned and did some stuff. I want to make sure that like, he was doing natural things to, in a sense, mitigate his fears. But he says this, that he, he never got rid of his fears. His fears were there the whole time. It was just trying to, in a sense, self-medicate, self-protect, self-preserve. Man, you got help. There's help for fear, all right? And it's spiritual, all right. That's right. So like he talked about, um, you have a spirit of power, you have a spirit of love. You have a spirit of a sound mind. So anything that doesn't go under that category has to be resisted. Yep. If anything else is coming that's not full of power, full of love, full of a sound mind, it's my job to resist that. That's yep. right. So it's not an emotion. It's not a feeling, right? It is a spirit, and it's also a prison. Go ahead and... Yep. So let's look at Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. And um, it says this, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all, or sorry, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Through fear of death. Like fear, sub, like look at the, again, through death, the fear of death, release from the fear of death. How can you be released from something if it's not actually holding you, caging you, free from bondage, free from the, the shackles of fear? I've, I, I've been in a place where fear, everywhere you go, everywhere, every decision you make, it's like you're walking around with the ball and chain of fear, and you're trying to figure out how to run and how to navigate and how to make the right decision, but yet it's fear is holding you from truly and freely making the right choice. I've parented out of fear. I've pastored out of fear. I've made financial decisions out of fear. I have made all kinds of decisions. And you know what? Most often they required me to repent. Sometimes we don't recognize this portion of when we, you and I yield to the wrong word. That's We need to actually repent. So... Financial decisions that, I, that, that I've made out, out of fear. Lord, I, I repent and I, I turn back around. When I make a decision with my kids uh, because out of fear, right, I have to go to them and say, hey, I'm sorry, right? All right, let's keep going here. And I don't know if this was later in the notes, but um, fear often will present itself. Um, you said, like, it, it binds you up like a, like a prison, you know? It'll keep you from moving. It'll keep you, you know, frozen with fear. That's what they say. Mm-hmm. But, but it'll keep you from, from stepping out. But, you know, a lot of times fear can mani- manifest itself through anger. Yeah, that's, that's coming Is up. Is that down? Yeah, okay, these two. So we, yep. Okay. Yep. Well, you but can. you can jump to that. Yeah, that's great. Well, I just, um, just want to encourage you to, um, the Lord's been talking to me about this uh, recently, um, just where I let some stuff slip. But... Where there's a lot of words, Proverbs talks about this. Where there's a lot of words, there, there's evil and there's sin. And I know we talk about this a lot, but it has to be talked about. Because we're, um, if we get into the doldrum of words and feeding, whether it's social media, whether it's news, whether it's conversations with people, and there is a lot of words which a lot of times are rooted in fear. And, yeah, like what's not going on, like what's not right, yep. what's not good, yeah. what's not, yep. like. That, and then also, um, you know, with people or, or with things, I just want to encourage us, as the body of Christ, we are to be an example in, in what we talk about, in what we post, in Um, setting the example of, am I approaching even an answer on a social media thing? Is what I'm doing, am I responding in faith or am I responding out of fear? And am I responding in anger? And you have to understand, anytime I'm operating out of anger, fear is usually always present. Usually always. Uh, That's... I know, Ben would correct me on that. <laughs> Usually always. But there's going to be fear present because um, 
any, anytime there's anger, a lot of times outbursts of anger or I just get what's driving that is fear of something. Right. It could be fear of death. It could be fear for my family. It could be fear financially. It could be, it could be fear. So like he said, that red flag, that's one of those red flags is, is something that's driving me. Be, I'm angry because I'm trying to defend someone or I'm trying to stand up for something or I'm trying. And I'm not saying we don't stand up for stuff. I'm not saying what I'm saying is that we choose to do what we do because God said to do it. And, it's and in that the we do it from of... spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. It's going to be from, from that place, which is a higher place over that spirit of fear and over that over the enemy ultimately yeah you really you speak from a place of authority and not self-defense right like you're not trying to it's just it's it so but yeah I mean, when you look at that and you fear why are you when when fear is present one of the indicators anger why are you angry well it's because you see your demise you see hurt if you're angry about a relationship if you're angry you know let's say you're angry with your children you get angry about something that happened with your children why are you angry at whatever it might be? Maybe you see something that was in your mom or your dad or your aunt or your uncle, and now you see a, some kind of sign or some kind of activity in your own son or daughter. And then when something like that happens, you get angry. Well, why are you angry? Because you're afraid. Because you received a word that says it's going to be like this and you have seen that that's not the best for them and you love them and so you move from a spirit of love and you move to and with a spirit of fear and you got angry. But wherever there's fear, there's always a faith response. Wherever there's a voice of fear of like, and you want to, you could get angry, you could, there's always a faith response. Instead of moving with the spirit of fear, but move with the spirit of love. Move with that spirit. In other words, God's portion, God's help. And you say that instead of saying the other thing. When you and I partner with the spirit of fear or the breath of fear, we're releasing more fear. We're, we're just letting that breath continue to fill the air. Unless you stop, and, and fear says this, there's no help and no hope. But wait, God gave you help and hope and power to overcome and want a victory. So See yourself winning in a place when you're angry, not you know, instead of losing, and that that's one way. That the other thing is, go ahead. You want to go to? Well, I was just gonna say back to the words thing. That's just something um, I know we've hit on a lot, but the Holy Spirit, I feel like, just keeps bringing that back, especially in the days and the times that we live in. There's already enough bombardment from the enemy that I need to make sure my gates, and we talk about that, but my eye gates, my ear gates, what I what I'm allowing to come into me. And you have control over that. Yep. You have control with what you put in front of your eyes and what you're listening to. And so um, the first place that I would say is if you feel like there is fear operating, look at what you've been putting in the gates. You know, in your children, in your family. Those are the first things. Look at what has been going into the gates of, of your home, into the gates of your children's eyes, your children's ears, your own eyes and your own ears. Because that's words. It's words. Well, how did God create? He created with words. Words are powerful. How did you get born again? Mm -hmm. Through words. Mm -hmm. And so words are very powerful, and words paint pictures. And words actually, like he said, it's a breath. It carries with it either a spirit of love or a spirit of fear. Yeah. And so check those gates. And just, um, just another encouragement to just watch the words that we put in front of us. And I love that. She said that again and again and again, and we've said that again and again. And, you know, the word of God comes to you and me, and it's not always like, oh, yeah, I want to hear that again. If the word of God came again, it's not to offend you. It's, it's to correct you. But if the word comes again and you're unwilling to be corrected, and I tell you, hey, again, and by the spirit of the Lord on a Sunday morning, the same thing is addressed. Can I tell you, if money is addressed in tithing and you just get offended by it, well, can I tell you why you're offended? Is because you're not being a doer of the word in that area. If you are offended about what's being said, about posting on this and on keeping, God, you, why you got to come to church and say that? Would you just quit off, get off that, get off that, get off that, get off that? The only reason it's still on that is the mercy of God for you and me. 
that, that you are in a place and you're hearing things and, and you don't know what a word would lead you and your family or your spouse. If something, I, I remember, I, I'm going to put this out here because I'm not afraid. <clears throat> I'm not afraid. I remember uh, probably two years ago, there was a, in my heart coming all the time talk about sports. And I made people tick. But it wasn't me. But it wasn't me. So you shoot the messenger. But I'm not the message. I'm not the one that, that wrote the message. But you're shooting the messenger. And so people get upset because a word is, would come and it was about sports and just putting it in the right portion. And, and I didn't, I never, it was never in notes. But I, people get so mad at me and they, people leave the church over that you, you're going to talk about sports again. I'm out of here. Sports are awesome. I love watching sports. I love playing sports. I, I love watching my kids go to sports. I, 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 there's times I'll go. I, I, and yet, for the last couple, I had not talked about, but only people that hear it when it, one word is mentioned is if I'm offended by it. The word of God comes to you and me not to tickle our ears, but to offend us. Jesus said, I come sometimes to offend. In other words, to say, ooh, that's not right. I, need, I got a choice to make here. And I'm telling you, there are times if the word comes again and again, rather than sit there and go, here we go, check your heart and say, if it's, it could be about offense. It could be if something's hitting again, if it's hitting again, it's hitting again. The teacher's present, and he's talking, and we can go, ha la 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 Or we can check our hearts and say, Lord, are you talking to me here? Have I, do I need to make an adjustment here? Just a tweak? You know, and I remember uh, um, uh, brother uh, Mark Hankins, he was talking about like, does this guy have any other messages? And the Lord said, he's got plenty of other messages. You just haven't got it yet. Yeah. So I'm having to come again. So sometimes I'm like, I, I honest, honest to God feel like would, would, if we would just grow up, we could move on. Yeah. Yeah. If we would just get the dribbling down, yeah. we could go to the shooting drill. Because I know everyone wants to go play shooting drill and play lightning. I like lightning too. But, but right now, we're, we're working on dribbling. Why? Because we don't got it yet. And this is, this is a fundamental portion of the game. And so this is a simple uh, a statement. I remember th that again, again and again and again. I wanted to crawl in a hole myself. You ever, as, it, as the pastor teaching, like, oh, I don't, Lord, oh, bleh, I felt like liar, liar. <laughs> Drew Carey, if you don't watch the movie, if you've never seen it, I saw, huh? Jim Carey, Jim Carey, where there's a, this show called Liar, Liar, and he had to tell the truth. The, the kid prays, God, I'm asking one day that my dad could not tell a lie. And it just, bleh, 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 here it comes. I'm like, oh, yeah, praise the Lord. All right. So when, when, when a word comes again and again and again, we would all do ourselves a favor to say, Lord, is there anything here that if I've heard this again and I'm hearing it again, do I need to make a tweak here? Because you're a good, you're a teacher, and, and it's not, like the, when the word comes out, it's not to manipulate. It's not to manipulate in any way. Like, oh, don't be on Facebook. Who, who said that? Nobody said that. He said, watch what's going in your ears. Guard your words. There's a t passage in Timothy where, where Paul tells Timothy, guard your doctrine. Go because in doing so, guard your words, the, the arrangement of words. In doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearer. Er, er, yeah, so yourself and them. So anyway, just wanted to jump on that because she hit it again. And the reason things get hit again is because the Lord's trying to teach us. It's his mercy. It's his kindness. Right? All right. So uh, we're talking about, again, recognizing fear, anger. The other uh, one of the signs uh, would be despair. So, so everybody's different. Some people are fighters. Some people are f like, some people fight and some people run. Some people, they get there, they're just, what's wrong? I'm afraid. They don't say that. I'm afraid. So you see either fight or you see like despair. An expectation of, of bad, a fear. And it says this uh, in Psalms 43.5. It says, why is my soul just downcast? 
Because my hope is in natural circumstances, not in God. That's what it says. Why, why, so, why, are you so, why, why, why am I so disturbed? He, he, he said, if you put your hope in God, I'll praise, there'll be praise. So when, when despair is not present, or excuse me, when despair is present and praise is not, it's because my trust is based on natural things instead of where my help comes from. Okay, so this is just, again, we're talking about fear. And in our families, if you and I will get a family of faith approach that there is help, there's help, I'm a child of God, there's no situation that is too hard for God or that God can't, can't do something in, God can raise the dead. That's that, that was Abraham, he reasoned, God can raise the dead. Let's start with the reason. Well, God can just raise the dead then. Well, the, well God will just have to do it a different way then. Well, God will just make a way, and, and I know we have this debt. I guess somebody's going to, another avenue, and some, the truck will just sell. Or I, I didn't even know that truck. God right now has a thousand ways to bless you that you have no clue about. Right now. Right now. Right now, God has a God has hundred different ways to do something you can't think of one. That's God. And so we're so limiting him, you know, and that's why fear is so present. So how do I resist fear? How do I resist it? So we see fear in families, but okay, great. I know I'm afraid that this is going to happen. I know I'm afraid of this. And you told me, I got all kinds of signs. They're going off. I've been yelling at my kids. I've been, what do I do? Well, listen, glad you asked. Glad you asked. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna resist fear. And we're going to conquer fear. In our families, we're going to resist and we're going to conquer. And we're going to start by magnifying the Lord. This is the key for you and I. This is where it starts in the situation of finance, in the situation with our children. Magnify the Lord with me. That's what he says. Go ahead and put it up there. Psalms 34, 3 through 4. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered I sought the Lord. There's a song. Maybe you put that one on. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust you. That's, I mean, that's a song. It's the word. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me, or he helped me. I sought the Lord. Right there. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And he didn't help. It doesn't say there that he helped me with some of my fears. He helped me cope. He helped me nope. manage. He helped me. No, he delivered me from all my fears. Broke me out of the walls. Broke me out of the prison. Amen. 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 He delivered me from all my fears. How? How did he do that? You had a part to play. You're magnif- you magnified him. You got him involved. That, that's bottom line. Mm-hmm. You got him involved. You begin to magnify him. Go ahead. And, um, you know, when we... You talk about like a magnifying glass. My son sometimes would use it to hurt ants. But um, <laughs> a magnifying glass, um, we can say if I look through something with a magnifying glass, what happens? It gets bigger. But does that image actually get bigger? Just to me. Who does it get bigger to? To me. So God can't get any more powerful. God can't get any more strong. What is it? When I begin to magnify the Lord, it's not that he changes because the word tells us he doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's a loving father. He's a provider. He's a healer. He's a restorer. He is that all the time. What magnifying him does is it begins to make him bigger to me. I begin to see his greatness. I begin to see his goodness. And then what? My countenance changes. I'm able to praise. I'm able to walk around with hope. I'm able to believe that God can restore my marriage. I'm able to believe that I have a whole family who's serving the Lord. It changes. He doesn't change. I begin to see who he really is. Uh, And so we we, we resist him. We resist fear. We praise. It stills the enemy. Right? This is a... Huge way to resist is praise, uh, magnifying the Lord. And then the second one is truly using just your words. See, we talked about a spirit of fear, the breath of fear. You don't fight a breath with natural things or even just quiet. You fight it with words. And so you have something to say. If you're going to fight words you don't, or fight fear, you don't just say something to your spouse. You say the word of God. I, and you say about God. 
So we said we're going we're gonna to start our reasoning with what God can do. So here's what Abraham said. He said, God can just raise him. God can. God can. The God portion. The God portion. My help portion. My father portion. Well, my dad's stronger than your dad. My, dad, my God can do anything. My dad can do it. Like you start with that. And so we'll, let's go to Psalms 91, 1 and 2. And this is, a, this is a famous passage of scripture that's used so often when fear is just everywhere. Like if you've been in a place of fear, maybe you're, uh, maybe you, you're about to go into the doctor for a surgery. Maybe you're about to have a child and you're like, I've never done this before. There's just so much concern because I heard this and the, you know, you're doing some study and I'm being prepared and being prepared. Well, are you prepared for this? And you're like, oh dear Lord, no, I wasn't prepared for that. And I don't know if I ever can be. And you start Googling some more. So let's defeat the fear. And then you're talking to your husband or your wife. Well, if you wouldn't be eating that. And he's like, ah, yeah, over something so silly. But it's not silly. It's very real. It's very real. And there's an answer to it. And it's when you and I say something of the Lord. So I, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Here's what he says. I will say. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. Uh, there's not a place. It, it's him. Him. He's my help. Where do I lift my eyes to the hills. I lift my eyes because that's where my help comes from. I look up my bank account to see where my help comes from. I look to, I lift my eyes. This is, this is such a simple, simple uh, exercise. It's the dribbling of the ball. Like, and we did this, I think, maybe it was Wednesday night. And we just said, let's just practice tonight. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when fear and anger and despair, let's just practice. This is the practice of overcoming, defeating fear. Just try it. Thank you, Lord. You're my help. You're my strength. I will say to the Lord. You are my refuge. You are my fortress. I trust you. Look right here. God, I trust you. I trust you. You're good. You're faithful. There's nothing too hard for you. You can raise the dead. You, you can. Rest- this, is where you, this is where it starts. I will say. So you, you use your words. You magnify the Lord, then you use your words. Um, Proverbs 18:21. And we've been on this on Wednesday nights for the last nine weeks, or, or uh, it, it, talking about the power of the tongue. Last, last Wednesday wasn't that, but life and death, or death and life, are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it, they're going to eat the fruit of it. It matters your and I, my response. It matters. Romans ten to eight, it says, "But what, what, but what does it say? The word is near you." Even in your mouth. This is talking about salvation. And if you were to go to Romans 10, 9 and 10, it talks about how you get saved. You believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth. Jesus says, Lord. But it says right here. It says your delivering power is so near you. Deliverance is right there. All you had to do is cry out. Like deliverance, salvation is near you. It's right there. The word is near you. Salvation, the word of salvation, it's right there. The help is near you. It's in your mouth. And it's in your heart. The word of faith, is, what is faith? Is what God said. God's portion to you, his promise to you. Again, going back to Abraham, when he said, he come, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, hey, I got something for you. You know, he says, stop being afraid. Stop listening to all of the other, all those voices that have been talking to you and talking to you and talking to you. And listen, this is how it's going to be. And I'm giving you my word. And I'm, and I'm making a covenant with you. And he didn't, this is what I love about God. And then Abraham, Abraham he kind of was like, uh, okay, cool. I, I can believe the land. I can't believe the child thing. That's why God cut covenant with him. So where he could really grasp, it's not based on you, it's based on me. And then he grew tired in fighting the fight of faith. Did you know he actually grew tired? But the Lord said that this is a guy of faith. But you know what? The Lord came to him again. Even when he laughed about it, oh, this is stupid. Can you believe that? And the Lord came again, and then his wife laughs, and he's like, hey, did you laugh? No, I didn't laugh. He lied. She lied. I didn't laugh. Can you imagine? Just write to God. (laughs) Did you just laugh? No, I didn't laugh. (laughs) What are you talking about? So, and, and God came again. You know, 
God, God's so good with us that way? You don't have to have it all figured out. He just, he's just even here saying, hey, I, I'm here to help you. I can, I'll help you. So in our, in our families, as we start to talk about a family, if it's all just about, you know, some social um, help like counseling, and if, if we approach this, this series and talk about families and marriage and, and all we're ta- giving to you is some just practical things and you're taking away the God component, the spirit side of things, when you and I are not wrestling so much against flesh and blood, the Bible tells us this, but we're wrestling against principalities. So much of our contest is not against one another. It's not with our children. There's a different breath involved. Right. And so this start of, the, of, of family and marriage, and as we talk about some very practical things to put into place and, and just, just raising a family and, 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 and having you know, love in our marriages... Uh, it, it starts with the foundation of God is here to help me. God is here to help me. And my family is going to finish strong. My family is going to be, it's going to have a testimony. My children and my children and my children's children, they're going to testify of the goodness of God. That They have help. They're going to recognize, my grandchildren are going to recognize that Papa, he calls upon the Lord and he answers. He has help. And when, when little Johnny is a little bit older, he's going to call upon the Lord just like Grandpa did. And, and it, it's just going to be passed on from generation to generation to generation. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, now faith is the substance of things to hope for. It's the evidence of what you don't see. And then he begins to declare how it come, came about. And he tar- starts with Abraham, and then he goes all the way through. Oh, it's a powerful, a powerful chapter just about what faith can do to a generation. Not just a generation, but a whole family. And it be passed down and passed down and passed down. And, and there's just story after story of what faith has done. Okay, you want to? You see anything here? Okay, then I want to. I want to go. I want to do this right here. I wrote this um, uh, just a picture of Hebrews eleven. So taking every verse in Hebrews chapter eleven, if you were to start there and read about the heroes of faith and how uh, just how, how Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then how Joseph, it was children's children's children, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Somehow Joseph got in there. Not too long, you got Joseph. Got, it wasn't, then it wasn't just Joseph. It, it's like going to Moses, right? And Moses did this, and he got the Passover, and Moses did that, or Moses' parents. Wait a minute, so it was Joseph, and then it was Moses' parents that hit him, and then it was Mo, Moses who, who called out in the Passover and, and, and then delivered, and, and they stepped out, and then it was like all these guys you haven't heard of, like Barak and Gideon and, and, and Samson and you're just like, who are all these guys? These are, these are children of Abraham. Let me say, children of faith. And so what we're talking about, you and your family, you can have children, children's children, children's children, because one person taught their kids, God is your father and he's my father, and we're going to follow and trust in him. I will trust in the Lord. I will say to the Lord, he is my help. He is my help. Your kids, because you, because you are willing to teach your kids who God is, your generations can be changed. And so I wrote like this, this, this kind of like uh, parallel to the, like almost just a testimony of what faith is and how it works. So faith is a sacrifice. It's a surrender of one's own way. Uh, one's own way to walk with God. It requires trusting his lead for your reward, you know, where it says, now, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that trust, must believe that comes to God, he must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of him. Like, all of this is just exact. All right, so I'm going to start over again. If you had your Bible reading through, you'd be like, oh, yeah, wow, that's cool there. Okay? Faith is a sacrifice. It's a surrender of one's own way to walk with God. It requires trusting his lead for your reward and for your family's protection and preservation. Faith trusts. God to lead and puts greater confidence in the inheritance he has been preparing for you, no matter the age or the stage, than you could secure for yourself. Faith always considers the character of God and declares he is faithful. Faith requires action and reasons that nothing is too hard for God. He can even raise the dead. It will take faith to raise a whole family. By faith, You break family curses. 
and release God's blessing, a blessing that your children's children's children will hold. Whole generations are changed and preserved when one person instills faith into their family, instills faith that they are children of God. You have a father that will never abandon you. You have a father who will shed his blood to rescue you. A family of faith in God will have these testimonies of victory. There is no sea too deep. There's no wall too high. There's no person too dirty. There's no identity too broken. There's no battle too great. There's no reputation too tarnished. There's no child too abandoned. There's no giant too big. There's no lion too fierce. There's not a flame that's too hot. There's not a weakness too limiting. There's no trial too daunting or persecution too strong or tribulation too great that God can't deliver you from. My God is all powerful. That was Hebrews chapter 11. My God is all powerful. There is nothing too hard for my God. That is, that, that's the story. It starts with what faith is, and Abraham exercises it. It affected his children's children's children, and all the way down, and testimony were different. It changed the outcomes of life. It changed whole family trees. It changed generation upon generation to where Moses' parents are saying, what do you want me to do, Lord? Hide him in the bushel. Directing every step in a time of persecution when you stand at a wall of a sea that's too, be- too deep to walk through. The Lord said, there's not a sea too deep, my God. The- when there's flames and it- you're ca- going to cast into the furnace, what are you going to do? I'm going to trust and I'm going to do what the Lord says. I'm going to trust and I'm going to do what the Lord says. I'm going to walk with help. I'm going to walk with my helper. I'm going to walk with a promise. I'm going to walk with one who never left me and never forsaken me. I have help. You have help, and it's found as in our Father. Why do I have a Father? Because I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. You can call upon Him, and He will answer. I will call upon Him, and He will answer. Can I impart that to my kids? Can I impart that to my kids? I, I desire to impart that to my kids. That that's my help. Not my own hand. Not my own work ethic. Not my own cleverness. The Lord. Lord. Not my healthy eating. Not my investment account. The Lord is my help. I'm going to have to have more trust in the inheritance that he has been preparing for me than I do in the one that I've been trying to prepare for myself. No matter the age or the stage I'm at. Because that's the thing about inheritance. It's like, you're like, oh, I hope somebody else has. Well, they're, they're mom and dad. They left them something. I don't know. My mom and dad don't have much, and I haven't been able to cure much. You're, what do you mean your mom and dad? Who's your father? Who's your daddy? Who's your, da- Who's your father? Because he's been preparing for you an inheritance. No matter the age or stage, put some trust in that. Put some hope in God. Why so downcast my soul? Why am I losing it? Why am I sad? Why... Because my hope is in something other than my help. And it's the Lord. Where does it come from? The Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so we talk about saying some things. I, 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 said, I said some things, but I, I, wanna, I want us to say some stuff this morning. So Psalms, 40, uh, Psalms 4 verse 8 says this. I, I will lie down in peace and sleep. Like, isn't that great? Yeah, I haven't been able to sleep because I've been, like, my, like, I'm just thinking, how am I going to, how about just put the word of God in, in before you? I got a bunch of decisions to make. I got a bunch of this. Yeah, you got help. You got help. And the Lord will lead you and he'll guide you. And he'll show you in the which way you should go. All you got to do is ask. I will, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O oh Lord. You make me dwell in safety. I love that. You alone, O oh Lord. Not a condition. Not when everything's perfect. No, just you alone. When it's going on, crazy going on all around, yep. You alone, Lord. You alone. Psalms 138, 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you, Lord, Lord, you revive in me. I just, I just can't take it anymore. I just, if I, if I have to deal with this one more time, how many times do I have to tell you? No, no. I'm just tired of this. No. Though I walk... In the midst of trouble, Lord, you, you revive me. You bring me strength. You stretch out your hand. Wow. Against the wrath of my enemies. Is, that's talking about protection, tarnished reputation. That's one right there. How many of you have ever lost some sleep 
over a tarnished reputation, over what somebody said about you, or what you think. The Lord's like, hey, I got you. I'm a shield round about you. And your right hand, you're, you're going to save me. Next verse. The Lord will perfect. God, you're working. You're perfecting that which concerns me. Your kindness, your mercy, that word mercy there is a seed. Covenant loyalty. Covenant. I'm in covenant with you. My, your covenant, O oh Lord, endures forever. And you do not forsake or leave or forget about the work of your hands. The Lord knows. You know what's going on, Lord. You know what I'm going through right now. You know what's up against me. And I just thank you that you're bigger, that you're greater. There's nothing too hard. There's no lion too fierce. There's no, wow. You got something to say. These are, these are a couple of, you know, put those bullets in your pocket. The God, he's preserving me. He's taking care of me. Psalms 138, 7 and 8. I can't tell you how many times I've texted that verse right there in a time of adversity when fear is just grabbing people. It's like, oh, thank you. I'd never, I, thank you for that verse. I didn't know where that was. I've maybe heard something like that before. The Lord is perfecting. He's writing that which concerns you. Look at, listen to this in the same verse in the Good News Translation. When I'm surrounded by troubles, surrounded. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You keep me safe. <laughs> you pose my enemies and you obey my anger. You... <laughs> Thank you, Lord. He's my help. He opposes my angry enemies and you save me by your power. You will do everything you've promised. Lord, your love is eternal. Complete the work you've begun. He, he, he began something as faithful, you know, to bring it to completion. So, um, why don't we stand uh, this morning? If you'll put up uh, Psalms 138, 7 through 8. I got th- three statements and then we're going to s- declare that verse together. We're going to mix our faith with it. Three statements I wanna, want us to say and, and, and believe it, mix our faith with it. So I'm going to say it before you say it. Because sometimes we say things and we say, repeat after me, and it's just like there's not really a heart mixed with it because you've got to believe in your heart. And so this first statement is this, that my family is going to make it all the way. My family is going to make it all the way. Like what does all the way look like? Oh, just walk Finish victory all the way, like just the ribbon hitting the chest, taking the first place, the best. My family's going to make it all the way. Wow, that's powerful. Second one is this. I'm raising a family of faith. Well, my family, because there's a lot of noise out there that my, I don't know if my kid's going to follow Jesus. I don't know about this. I'm just praying that they come. No, I am raising a family of faith of faith I'm raising a family of faith you just answer that spirit of fear with the spirit of power help spirit of love which he loves and sound mind and then the last one is this I have a family that walks in victory the story has been defeat the story has been despair it's but what has happened to you but it's got to change I have a family that walks in victory. I have a family that walks in victory. I I am raising a family of faith. And my family will make it all the way. Like that's a those are simple things to to put in our mouths and and, and release faith for for our families. And so we're gonna do that this morning. My family is gonna make it all the way. Glory to God. I'm raising a family of faith. My family walks in victory. victory. Psalms 138, 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. You can say it with me. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. And your right hand will save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, it endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hand. Father, we lift our hands to you, and we just say, you are where our help comes from. 
We lift our hearts. We lift our eyes. We thank you that you're for families, that you do impossible things, that there's nothing too hard for you. And we say this morning, we trust you. Thank you for allowing us to call you Father. And that you would call us your children, your sons, and your daughters. Lord, I'm asking you for just an impartation of sonship of that we're yours this morning. As moms and dads and grandpas, that we would know you as Father. So that we could teach our children to trust you. You are our help, our hope, our strength. Thank you for being very present right now in times of need. Thank you for your help. So I thank you even just right now, right now in this moment. We're just, if you're needing help, you just call upon him right now. The thought to thank you for your help and coming as your son and as your daughter. I'm asking you for help in this situation. Direction. Your word, your promise. I just say, I trust you. Show me my part. Because I know you're faithful to do yours. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. I just had to close your eyes. And if you've been battling just a spirit of fear, we're just going to bind that up in the name of Jesus Jesus. together. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just take authority over any spirit of fear in marriages, in families, in this church, in the name of Jesus. We bind you up up and you must be removed in the the name name of Jesus. Jesus. And we just loose a spirit of love, Uh, a spirit of power and a sound mind in the name of Jesus. Freedom from bondage, freedom from fear in Jesus' name. And we thank you. Moving forward, we will be free. Free in the name of Jesus. Freedom from fear in Jesus' name. That was a very practical application that you and I need to be exercising at home. Peter I know and Paul I know, but who are you? The Spirit said this to these these men that were trying to cast out demons, trying to cast out a spirit. And they said, Peter I know and Paul I know, but who are you? In other words, they recognize sonship. They recognize the name, that which is a part of the family by blood. You look like your dad. Aren't you your dad's boy? I, I know that I know I know you're Nate's boys. Are you Sam or are you Matt? Or are you Caleb? But but but, the, but who are you? When you're at home, you're not waiting for this. When you sense a spirit of fear, when you sense any kind of something that's not from the Lord, you just say, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. I bind you up. I take it and I cast you out. You're not welcome here. You have no authority. That simple. You speak to it. And you know what? Sometimes, like Jesus, he spoke to it. And you know what it did? It just seemed to get all the louder. So you know what he did? He said, I said, so don't stop until it's gone. Don't stop until it's gone. Amen? Amen. And just a good um, passage that you can meditate on is Psalms 91. Just be meditating on Psalms 91, Psalms 23. You know, we talked about that at the very beginning of the year, if you were here from Brother Keith. But those passages, keep those in front of you. Keep those in front of you because those are words that minister life, that take away the spirit of fear. Amen. Amen. So we have whole families in the name of Jesus. Whole families in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll bless you as you go. Father, I thank you for this, this people. Thank you that you're for us, not against us. That you make ways when it seems to be no ways. I thank you that you said your word is a lamp to our feet and it's a light that shines ahead to where we're to go. So I thank you for the answers for today and the direction for tomorrow. 
And I thank you for filling our hearts with peace and that we would know that truly you are where our help comes from. Bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Don't forget to sign up for small groups. Wednesday, 6.30.